it's another week and we're back with another interesting episode i can't believe that we're almost at the yes. end of the season absolutely just one more to go i know Big i ass. think we're done and yeah i hope we've all been doing well without much ado we're just going to get right straight all right it. okay <laughs> let's go okay so in the news um accra has been named by unesco as a world book capital for 2023 so unesco is the united nations education scientific and cultural organization and their world book capital initiative has the aim of encouraging a culture of reading so they actually open applications so it's something that you have to i guess put in a proposal for which apparently accra did which i'm just like mm, that's a bit suspicious but anyway <laughs> that's because i'm very cynical but anyway so uh yes accra will follow guadalajara which is going to be the world book capital city for 2020 and during the year-long program it will seek to target marginalized groups with high levels of illiteracy including women mm -hmm. youth street children and people with disabilities so the committee selected accra for its strong focus on young people and their potential to contribute to the culture and wealth of ghana and also it's um, the strong human rights dimension, which aims to raise awareness about freedom of expression and information. So activities for the World Book Capital Year will include the introduction of mobile libraries to reach marginalized groups, um, holding workshops to promote reading and writing, uh, and writing and then books and, and an emphasis on um, creating books in different Ghanaian languages mm -hmm. and also establishing skills and training centers for unemployed youth. Mm -hmm. Right. So on the face of it, I mean, I love it. I love the idea. But of course, again, being the cynic that I am mm -hmm. and having and knowing what these people are up to these days, I just have a feeling like it's a weird money grab. Mm -hmm. Like they're just hoping yeah. to get a bit of coin out of UNESCO it. so they can do like one launch event somewhere mm -hmm. fancy mm -hmm. eat buffet and, all those uh -huh. things and then, then, then just then we'll never we'll see money. maybe one mobile Lucky library around in a crowd in a crowd somewhere mm -hmm. and that would be the end of it right mm -hmm. but i mean i hope i hope that they mean it and that they plan to actually do mm -hmm. what they said in the proposal which apparently was very very sexy and i'm Ooh, like because yeah. they're like oh emphasis on human rights and like <laughs> where here <laughs> Freedom of information. Out words anyhow, like, you know. Since when? When even we over here, people have been like, hey, you guys are talking too much. Like, right? Right? People are like, your mom, they're like, yes. oh, it's a mistake, it's a mistake. because you know, you know, like, it's not, people don't feel like they can talk. Well, I guess, I mean, I don't know, because on the flip side of that, people, like, everybody gets on Instagram and just starts talking rubbish. Yeah, so yeah. I don't know. I don't think, but I don't know. I will, I guess watch Making with skepticism mm. but hope, hope which yeah. is what kills you the hope <laughs> <laughs> but anyway that's my in the All right, news. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> so my in the news is for those of us who are lactose intolerant are you lactose intolerant very because mm. i don't care <laughs> same i we sometimes i just don't care so if you're lactose intolerant there is a, another plant-based milk out and I mean, currently you've got you've got an array of, of you've got this choices. one better not be roaches. <laughs> no, 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 no. I would have even got. I hate cocoa Exactly. So. so you've got your oats and your almond and your soy milk and all sorts of things, but um, and it's really great, right? But uh, compared and compared to the carbon footprint of dairy, like regular cow's milk, which is about three kilogram uh, carbon dioxide per liter. Oat milk, for example, has 0 0.9 and almond milk is at 0 0.7. So you think that, okay, that's much better, isn't mm -hmm. it? Unfortunately, there are other issues with that. For almond milk, for example, 80% of almonds are grown in California. And if you didn't know, California is known for droughts. Mm -hmm. So that ends up as 120 liters of water used for just, just to make one glass of almond I milk. See. And that is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely not sustainable in the long run. And add to that the carbon footprint of, of of shipping it around the world that makes it even worse. So almond is not necessarily seen as something that is very sustainable. Right? Soy milk. So soy milk has a low um, CO2 per kg and also has low water use. However, the Amazon forest is being cleared to make space to grow soy, and that is destroying it. That's mm. environmentally, we don't want that. 
oat milk, oat, oat milk seems, seems to be the most sustainable of all of them. And however, you're, people are still looking out for other options. And so a Swedish professor, Eva, Eva Thornberg, has created milk from potatoes and rapeseed oil. Well, right? mm, okay. <laughs> so from an environmental perspective, this is great because it has a lower carbon footprint than all the others I've mentioned already. And it is twice as, as efficient as growing oats and uses 56% less water than almonds. So all in all, it's a good choice. There have been Amazon reviews on there. People seem to like mm. it. Oh, so yes, it's available. It's already, yeah, it's already available. Yes, you can buy it. I'd like to try it. Yeah, yeah. And, but people have said that it splits tea. So if you put it in mm. tea, then it, it But splits. then the other ones, they've said it does that as well. Uh, as well. So, exactly. Whatever. So that's. I don't think that's... I, I guess if you don't like the texture, it's an issue for you. But if you think of the greater good for all of us, I guess... Potato, um, potato milk might might be the new thing. Yeah, yeah cool. So that's something for you. <laughs> yes, great, excellent. Okay, so now we're on to songs of the week. Okay, so I have three songs this week. No surprise there. <laughs> the first one is called Self Love, and it's by Skills Figure Eight, featuring Black Bones. Drizilic and NM. Hey, you always <laughs> have these artists that have never heard of So before. do you. So oh my like... God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Skills Figure Eight's real name is Habib Tamu, and he's a 24 year old singer, and he is of Sierra Leonean descent, and he was born there and eventually, after some time, moved to the States, and then finally settled in Ghana, where he has worked on. Uh, both his debut and subsequent EPs. Um, and then also his debut album, which came out called After Dark, mm -hmm. and that's what came out in 2021. So he describes his sound as coastal music, which is an amalgamation of all his musical influences. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so Self Love is a track on the After Dark album. And then um, Enam is a singer who I've mentioned here yes, before, yes, singer rapper, yes, yeah, she's gone in. Yeah. Drizilic is a hip hop artist from Sierra Leone as well. And then Black Bones is a Nigerian rapper and he's signed to 100 Crowns, which is a sub print of Chocolate City Music. A lot wow. of people know <laughs> Chocolate City because of MI. MI yes. And then um, 100 Crowns is a sub print label, which is owned by a friend of mine, AQ, who's also mm. an excellent rapper. So shout outs to him and all the team at 100 Crowns. I was, when I was researching, I was like, I know this hundred crowns. Oh, right. So I actually messaged him. I'm like, cue this one of your boys. Anyway, so self love. It's I mean, it's super vibely. In fact, the whole um, After Dark album is really cool. It's just a fun, smooth listen. It's got awesome features on it, like this. And uh, yeah, it's definitely worth checking out. So that's my first song there. Second song is called Gallus by Capella Gray. Um, so Capella, <laughs> I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> All these new interesting <laughs> names. <laughs> so Capella Gray is Curtis Jackson the second. No relation to Fifty Cent. That's not his son, even though Fifty Cent is also Curtis Jackson the second. Um, he's a 27 year old singer, rapper, and instrumentalist. He's from New York, but he's of Jamaican heritage. Um, he was raised in church, as a lot of these uh, artists are, and that's where he cultivated his love of music. He learned how to play a multitude of instruments, including drums, piano, and guitar. He produces his own music as well as ghost produces and writes for other artists in the New York area for the meantime, including King Combs, who is Diddy's son. Um, so he put out a debut album in 2020, and then in 2021, he released uh, Gyalis as a buzz single, um, just for funsies, more or less, not expecting it to blow up, but it went super viral if you're on tiktok and that kind of thing you probably mm -hmm. heard, heard the song yeah mm -hmm. and so um that him blowing up off that song actually got him signed to capitol records so he got a deal out of that and then they re-released the song mm -hmm. along with a video um, over the summer and so Gyalis, if you know your patwa it's mm -hmm. a womanizer oh geez. yes okay. yes so honestly, this is like a complete unadulterated F-boy anthem. Like it's pure nonsense. But the song is so catchy <laughs> that I'm like, you know, it's about how basically he's a gallus and mm -hmm. you can't lock him down and he'd be gone. Yes. But, you know, one of the lines, she took, came back to my crib and then she, I was trying to kick her out and then she was acting like she was asleep. Oh, I mean, pure yeah. nonsense. 
God. But it's a very, 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 very... I'm ashamed how much <laughs> I love this song. So, yeah, anyway, so that's my second song. Oh, and also samples Juvenile's Back That Ass Up. I mean, come mm, on. Okay. If you're of a certain age, and minute you hear that doom, mm. like you can't not move. Okay, anyway, so that's my second song. And my third song is kind of a bit of a swerve, or maybe not, because we do feature some really random songs mm. on here. Uh, but my third song is Eleanor Rigby by The Beatles. Oh. Yes. So, you know, obviously it feels it feels odd to like try and do a whole biography about The Beatles. I mean, they actually are the best-selling artists of all time. So I feel like either you know them or you don't. So, but yeah, four guys from Liverpool, right? Um, Paul McCartney, was it Ringo Starr, John Lennon, and George Harrison. Um, they formed in 1960. Um, and basically, again, shut down the game. Like, mm -hmm. literally, the, the you know, they had the whole Brit wave. And again, they were only a band for 10 years and became the best-selling artists of all time, still. So that should give you an idea of the impact of mm -hmm. the Beatles, right? And they're still popular to this day. Um, they have the most number one albums in the UK, still. Mm -hmm. uh, they have the most number one Billboard singles, still. Uh, the most singles ever sold in the UK still, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, more awards than you can count, right? And so they also released 14 albums during that time. So they were extremely pro prolific. And um, also, like, I think three or four movies, um, including Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club, which went along with that album, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so... Um, you know, a lot of people have been like, oh, they're overhyped, right, because of all this stuff. And I don't know. I actually really enjoyed the Beatles music, and I think they were very experimental. I think, obviously, some of their sound has been accused of being appropriated because mm -hmm. one of their albums, they went to India and were, you know, what, and so a lot of the, like, you hear tablas mm -hmm. and stuff like that in their songs. But it's in the spirit of creative arts, right? Of pushing the sound forward. And I think they very much did that. So I kind of love the Beatles. Okay. So this song now was released in 1966 as part of a double A side with Yellow Submarine. And it's, I think what, first of all, it's very unique. Again, the Beatles have always put out extremely unique sounding Sounds, records. Yeah. And this one is about, it talks about loneliness, actually. So Eleanor, it talks about three different people. Eleanor Rigby, Father Mackenzie, and who? I can't remember. Anyway, and all just about how they exist in a space of loneliness. So it's quite moving, but also really cool. And yeah, so that's my third song this week, <laughs> Eleanor Rigby by The Beatles. So to go over, I have Self Love by Skills Figure 8 featuring Black Bones, Drizillic, and Enam. Gialis by Capella Gray and then Eleanor Rigby by The Beatles. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I have two songs as usual. <laughs> <laughs> and the first song is a song from Anthony Hamilton. I love, oh, love, 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 love. Yes. Him. And the song is titled I Thought We Were in Love. Uh, so he re recently released an album called Love. Oh, yes. Nice. Yes, about um, a few couple of weeks ago. Ooh, cool. Yeah. And the album is called uh, Love is the New Black and it's a beautiful 14 track album basically like a love poem to the world mm. i would say and but also listening to the song i thought i could recognize some other song in it so i, I kept i kept listening and i'm like no this is something i know and i happen to love teddy pendergrass mm. so of course i could hear that his late you're my you're my latest greatest inspiration that's exactly what you hear when you listen mm. to the song so you've got uh, you've got two of your favorite artists and you hear songs like hear similarities and i was absolutely blown i said oh, this song i, I am to going to talk ASAP. about yes. so you may know anthony hamilton probably from his song charlene that's probably one of his most famous songs he's been nominated for 17 grammy awards and he also started singing in the church like so many others and he actually joined and sang back up for d'angelo on the promo of his voodoo um mm. yes, i did not know that didn't know that either but he was, and he was also on two parts, Thug's Mansion Remix. I love, I love that one. Mm. So, yeah, very, very good. Very, 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 very good. I mean, he's been singing for a long time. He has seven albums to his name and he's just really a fantastic all round singer. He's got a very rich voice. His live Absolute, performances are stunning. Absolutely just... amazing. So that's, I thought we were in love from Anthony Hamilton. 
My second song is a song called Obra, and it's from Nana Nana Kwame and Pedu. Funny he, story, I almost chose that right? because he just passed, passed away. I, exactly, I almost chose that. Yeah, <laughs> so we've lost a legend. Yeah. Um, Nana 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 Kwame and Pedu was born uh, 31st March 1945 in the Eastern Region in a place called Adiemra, and in school at, at the Anglican Middle Boys School, he was made a chorus a chorister and also a tune picker. So that's quite interesting his mm -hmm. music musical career started pretty early much later he would meet eddie donko and then they would form the african brothers band initially they were not given the time of day because they were small boys you know how mm -hmm. they are? these are small boys so we are not going to listen to them but then later he met jerry hansen from the rumblers dance band gave him some of the songs to perform the songs did really well and then jerry introduced him to uh phillips west africa recording publishers he recorded two songs, they became a hit, and it just went up from there. So, Obra is for for those of us who are a certain age, you know, like Sunday, it's playing in my right, head right, right. Now. <laughs> so, Sunday evening, you've got your Obra, or the, 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 there was, um, there was TV show. a TV yeah. show called Obra. So, you're sitting there, that's the tune that plays when it starts. And, and you know, it's, right, you're, it's time to start thinking about school. Or Listen, whatever the next exactly, day. <laughs> because that's the thing you're going to school, right? And so that's Opera, a really beautiful song. And apparently, he also composed a song for the for NEC party mm -hmm. in 1992. He's got over 800 songs under his Crazy. belt. Um, he was a nationwide uh, music, he won the nationwide music composer in 1973. Oh, wow. And was crowned singer in chief. And he also helped set up the Copyright Society of Ghana. So he actually did a lot oh, for him. May he rest in peace. Indeed. Obra is a beautiful, beautiful song. I really, really love it. And that is my second song. Wonderful. So two songs, just to recap. Anthony Hamilton, I thought we were in love. And Nana Kwame and Pidu with Obra. Wonderful. <laughs> and uh, as you can hear, our third co-host is back again. The <laughs> The chicken. Um, so please excuse us and him. Yeah, he uh, just wants to be a part of. He, this. Yes, wants attention so badly. Mm -hmm. Must be a Gen, Gen Z chicken. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on to what the f this week, and it is on garden hermits. Okay, mm -hmm. so yes, if when you think of a garden hermit, the first thing that comes to mind is probably a garden gnome which is a small figurine, usually of some kind of, well, a gnome mm. or an old person that you buy and stick in your garden as part of the decor. Okay, well, what you didn't know is that it has a really wacky and somewhat creepy history to it. So in Victorian England, which would be the 18th and 19th century or during the reign of Queen Victoria, it became fashionable for wealthy landowners to build hermitages as part of the landscape art in their garden. Now, a hermitage is a dwelling place for a hermit or a recluse, but also a place for religious seclusion um, to where you can go and, I guess, pray in isolation and whatnot. Um, and it, they go back to Roman times where apparently some popes actually did build hermitages where they would go and seclude themselves for prayers and so on and so forth. But the British, um, in this case, um, sort of use it in the sense of a place where a recluse or hermit lives. So what they would do is build small cottages, sometimes design, designed to look like caves or grottos, mm -hmm. um, as part of like landscapes for their, you know, massive glorious gardens. Well, so apparently they thought that wasn't enough of a flex, right? So mm -hmm. what they did was they soon began to hire real people usually, well, always men, mostly agriculture workers, mm -hmm. to actually take up residence in these small cottages and hermitages mm -hmm. um, and pr basically play hermits in what? there. Yes. <laughs> so that's where a garden hermit comes in. Mm -hmm. So um, one Professor Campbell, Gordon Campbell of Leicester University, so shout out to my alma mater, <laughs> wrote a book on hermits and cited a real newspaper ad from 1797 that said the hermit was to be employed for a period of seven years. During that time, he was not allowed to leave the hermitage. He was not allowed to speak to anyone. He was to wear robes that a druid would wear. So like, you know, long, flowy, traditional robes. And he was not to bathe or cut his hair or nails during that seven year period. So you were supposed to literally look like, you know, 
like one of these fairy tales, mm -hmm. the old man mm -hmm. in the woods. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so they had different, you know, different expectations. Some didn't allow their hermits to wear shoes as well. But then you had some who expected that their hermits would memorize poetry or songs so that to entertain guests when they're like, oh yeah, we have a hermit, come see. Oh and then when you walk down there, then he like sings you a song or something. Oh my so, you know. <laughs> yes. So eventually, and I would say thankfully, hermit hermitages fell out of fashion along with the garden hermits that went along with them. Mm. And what was left became a figurine that was right. symbolic of a time when you literally paid someone to live in your garden. I mean, I feel like this is an example of like ridiculous excess yeah. and treating poor people, people like yeah, accessories. But then of course, during the Victorian era, it was beginning to be the beginning of the industrial revolution. So you had, you know, serious um, rural urban migration, the kind of stuff we deal with now, mm -hmm. where people moved en masse and then they were in slums and then food insecurity, the high rate, you know. Right. So some people were like, listen, I don't it's even, I'm homeless. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. It's better than nothing, but I just thought it was really crazy and kind of creepy. So it yeah, is, that's, that's an interesting story. Yeah. Okay. Right. So in my what the f today, we're talking about a police officer and the abuse of power. Hmm. So a police officer has been remanded for having sex with a woman who had been held in cells, and he allegedly released her in exchange for sex. Now, absolutely, I was I was so furious when I read the story. <sighs> So the woman had been convicted of stealing and was waiting to be sentenced. And then a certain Lance Corporal Akuma. Uh, oh, this is Ghana. This is, oh yeah, this is, sorry, yeah, this is Ghana. Huh. He gave the woman two sachets of, I think it was coconut water to drink. Then he coerced her and, and tricked her into believing that the, de the detective who was working on the case wasn't a nice man. And so she would be in trouble. And so she, she should have sex with him uh -huh. so that he would let her go. So she agreed. Once they were done, he opened the cell for her to take a shower, and then he put her, her things in front of the police station, I guess, and then told her to run. Now, once she got home, she went to her father-in-law and then told him what had happened. So okay. he, of course, he went back and reported the incident to another police father -in -law. station. Father-in-law. So this yes. is a married woman, then. Yes, that's exactly what I thought too. Oh this woman was married. So he reported the incident to uh, some police station. And then Theresa was rearrested and then handed over to the original, the original police station where she was. The Lance Corporal, of course, was charged with rape and aiding uh, the escape of a convict. Again, you have these issues of people in power abusing their power. Always, like, what was, like, constantly, how is this constantly. okay? How is this okay? You, a policeman. So what has happened to him? Because we he's know we made... love transferring people instead of firing Exactly. Them. I, I think he's, he's meant to come to court again for something. I'm not quite sure what, what happened to him. Um, I yeah, hope they keep, keep, keep on it and don't let him mm, just skate. He's, he's going to be transferred. That's exactly what's going to happen. Transfer to another place and probably going to do it there and then get away with it. We, we're also not helping by transferring mm -hmm. these people. He should be no, in jail. You should, yes, exactly. And I'm actually happy that he was, he was, he was charged for rape. I know, because that, that in itself is not even like they could have just brushed it all under the, under right, the rug. Right, which... Absolutely ridiculous. He should be oh, ashamed dear. of himself. Disgusting. Mm -hmm. Really, really. Yeah. So okay. that's my what the <laughs> Now on to two passwords. All right. So you may you probably have already seen the title of, of the of my two passwords, and it's called Barbara and Joe. So you're probably like, hmm, mm -hmm. Barbara Bush and <laughs> like Joe. Like who the hell are you talking Joe about? Biden. Okay. I know, right? <laughs> well, Barbara and Joe are the embodiment of two faces of a relationship coin. So you have Barbara the Builder and Joe Potter. <laughs> so I'm going to explain. So who is Barbara the Builder? Well, Barbara the Builder is a female version of Bob the Builder, who you know, well, you may not know, but grown. But if you have kids or you know Bob the Builder, which is a British cartoon, you know who that is. Barbara is the woman who answers the call anytime she sees a man talking about he's, some, he's looking for someone to build oh. with or who builds him up mm. and um she's there like pick me please <laughs> i will build you because oh i'm barbara the builder okay oh and usually in my experience anytime a man is talking about he's looking for somebody to build him up or build with what he's really saying is i have nothing or i'm not on your level mm. 
oh, I know you can do better, but please deal with me, support me, help me, give me somewhere to stay whilst I sort myself out however mm. long that takes. Well, then on the other side, you have Joe Potter. Now, my friend laughed at me when I, when I, when I said, because I was like, I, I didn't create this term. And she's like, you're a bush girl. Like, where did you get that from? So Joe Potter is basically Joe Potential. potential. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Joe Potter is the guy who is clearly going places, mm. but hasn't gotten there yet. But you see the path ahead, right? And that's how he's different from the uh, project managers or the building managers mm -hmm. over there looking for people to come and build for them, right? right. Um, in that one case, you can see the trajectory in the other, you can't, right? So the question today is, should you ever be a barber the builder or should you date a Joe Potter? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you right now, spoiler alert, I don't know. I can't say, but I know I do have some things here that are worth considering Ooh, yeah. whilst you make that Let's decision. Right. <laughs> um, so the first thing, obviously, which I already touched on slightly, is that there's a difference between being supportive and being a mason, mm -hmm. right? There's a difference between understanding your Joe Potter's goals and dreams and offering suggestions or even motivation to help him attain said goals versus having a man who doesn't even know what he wants yet or he has some unrealistic goal like you know he wants to be a basketball player but he's mm -hmm. five foot nine mm -hmm. and his jump shot is ass right something <laughs> like that um so you the first thing is to understand what you're dealing with is this a joe potter or is this one of them building project managers mm -hmm. who is looking for somebody to that he's going to lean on yeah or even take advantage of or take advantage of we've yeah. all heard the term hobo well not all homosexual mm. somebody who would date anyone just for a place to stay right so know who you're know who you're dealing with would be my first suggestion right um the second thing i would say is that age is a factor in both cases the older you get the less acceptable either scenario is right mm -hmm. so for example when you're 20 it's perfectly acceptable to date either a joe potter or one of these looking for a builder type mm -hmm. somebody who is looking for a mason right um so let's you know presume that you go on the normal track high school university la la la, la right so you're in university Joe Potter is in university. In fact, you are Josephine potential yourself. He's Joseph, <laughs> you're Josephine. You're all moving. You're probably a broke student, but no problem because you both are on a trajectory, right? Now, if you're Barbara the Builder, it's possible that you're still in university. Maybe your man decided he's going to work at home on becoming a music producer or whatever it is. So he's not going to university, right? So he's at home playing around on Fruity Loops, talking about he's about to have a big hit soon. And that's fine. Like, again, when you're in university, maybe this was your high school boo or whatever it is. Yeah. That scenario is almost borderline romantic. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a starving artist mm -hmm. and I'm working to, you know, we're all working towards our goals. However, the minute you leave university and enter the workplace, this is when, you know, the, 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 distinctions start to appear where when you are clocking in nine to five busting your ass whatever and your dude is 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 you know up till 4 a.m so mm -hmm. he sleeps all day because he's like you know i've been working on beats mm -hmm. or whatever it is it starts to get a little grating mm -hmm. right and so that is where it, we, being a barber the builder over the age of let's say 25 26 mm -hmm. is probably a no-no mm -hmm. literally now, if you're if it's a Joe potential situation, you actually have much longer. Like Joe Potters have about ten more years mm. than these, you know, looking for a Mason types to get to because you're like, okay, we all know, you know, success takes time. Mm. He went to get his first degree. Maybe he's going to get a master's degree. Yeah. Blah 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 blah. But then, even then, by the time let's say you're forty, because we've grown over mm. here. Like I'm about to be forty. Mm. D now dating a joke i mean let's put it this way your potential should be have been achieved or maybe like we should see that you're almost there. there you can't yeah. still be on the same 
potential trajectory mm-hmm. as a 20 something year old. Mm-hmm. So again, age is a factor in both scenarios. Joe Potez have up to maybe 40 and then you're kind of side eyeing the situation. Mm-hmm. Like you when still, is, exactly. Whereas it? one of these come build me up types, I would cut them loose at 25, 26 max. Mm-hmm. So again, that's another thing to consider. Third point to consider there is no trophy for separation. This is something I'm. <laughs> this is a hill I will die on. Okay, like in either case, whether it is a come build me, I'm looking for a Mason, or it is a Joe Potter, there will always be somebody who has already achieved their potential, who already knows what they want, who have already attained their, who are doing it for themselves, and who can do it for you too. Right now. Women, a lot of women, uh, we are expected to date on a basis of hypergamy, right? Mm-hmm. You're supposed to, which basically means you're always supposed to date up. You're supposed to d- be with somebody who has more money than you. If you're on one level of success, you're supposed to be with somebody who is on a, a higher level of success. If education is to be more educated than you, so on and so forth. Personally, I'm not that extreme. Mm-hmm. I feel like when you reach a certain level of self-accomplishment, or the higher level of accomplishment you attain independently, mm-hmm. it becomes less important Absolutely. and also more difficult. Because if you've worked and you're a CEO, then it's left with dating Elon Musk or exactly. the president. Exactly. Like, exactly. Who are you even going to yeah. date? Yeah. So I feel like, but my personal philosophy is always date your equal. I feel like you're equal and that doesn't necessarily really always have to be financial yes, yeah, yeah. or financial or whatever. Yeah. Always date your equal. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and tell you to date down though. That ain't going to be me. <laughs> Somebody else can do that, but not me. <laughs> so, you know, um, but at the end of the day, you do not get extra brownie points for hopping on the struggle bus with some guy who has, either not made it because he's not there yet or not mm. made it because he doesn't even know where there is, right? You can always just go and find somebody who is in neither of these categories and get your, live your best life. So that's another factor to consider. You don't get extra points for joining somebody in their struggles for 10 mm. years or whatever. Mm. Final point, know your man. Know who you're with. And here I will give you real life examples of two Joe Potentials, in one, it went disastrously wrong. So some of you may know who Betty Broderick is. In fact, she was in the news again recently because she's up for parole. Um, So Betty met her future husband at university. He was studying, um, he was in, he was studying, he was pre-med, and she was getting her her degree in education. They got married after college, had five kids together. So he went to med school and during that time, you know, she was working as a teacher and then selling Avon on the side and stuff because she was a breadwinner. She was supporting the family. All right. Well, this dude finishes uh, med school now and he's like, oh, um, he wants to go to law school as well. So she's like, hmm, okay. (laughs) So she kept on hustling, working multiple jobs to get enough income because again, her five kids and him. And then he finally finishes law school and it's like, great. Now he's a doctor, doctor, because he's a doctor of medicine, doctor of law. So he opens a law firm and life was fantastic, right? But then he decided to hire some 21 year old as an illegal assistant at his law firm. This was in 1982. They had met, I can't remember when they met, but they had been together for a while by this point. Mm -hmm. And by 1985, he decides to leave his wife. Oh, oh, after okay, so when the good times finally started rolling, and he was a prominent, successful lawyer. And again, because he was a lawyer, she wasn't able to get, I guess, qualified representation because everybody was like, "Ah, but that's your house." That's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So she ended up losing her house, losing custody of all the kids, and basically was a middle-aged woman with nothing. Absolutely nothing to show for all the time she invested with him. So, and then she said on top of everything, you know, they were taunting her, the new wife, because this legal assistant soon became new wife. And they were both living in the house that she used to live in with her husband before she got thrown out. And yes, she snapped. So in 1989, days before her 42nd birthday, she broke into the house and shot the two of them. So... 
let this be a cautionary tale that just because you sit there talking about I'm gonna support your dreams mm. does not mean it will pay off. In That's the, the thing. Way. That's what your people don't. I don't. People don't get. People think that as long as you are going to sacrifice for somebody, they are going. They're to, going to accept. Yeah, they're going to accept. Value that. Reciprocate. Be grateful. No, not yeah, necessarily. Say, I don't owe you anything. Thank I didn't you. Ask I didn't you ask you to, you to do, do that. that. Why did you do that? Thank you. Then, on the other hand, you have the case of Martin. Ginsburg, who is Ruth Bader Ginsburg's oh. husband, one of my sheroes, I love her, <laughs> um, who was a Supreme Court judge and passed, I think, last year. When did she pass? So. Anyway. So they also met in school. Same story. Both of them went to law school and both of them struggled together. She had kids before she entered law school. She was married. It was a struggle to deal with the children, mm -hmm. both of them being students. You know, he, he developed cancer along the way. She helped him through that. So she was, you know, at one point she was working, going to school, raising kids, dealing with her husband that was sick, all sorts of things. But they were a team and apparently everybody knew them and said they had a once in a lifetime mm -hmm. kind of love where, you know, she, cause she broke many barriers being the first woman this, the first woman that. And he was always there in her corner, cheering her on, pick my wife, pick my wife. And in fact, you could say that she exceeded his level of success mm. because she became a Supreme Court justice and he did tax law and he was successful, but yeah. he wasn't on her level and he didn't, but he was proud of her till his last day on earth. So yeah, like you say, you have to be a team. It's cause otherwise it's not going to work. So basically I'm just saying that you can't just because they're joke, don't necessarily think that you're going to get the fairy tale ending. Mm. So anyway, that's my two past words. <laughs> it, just, it doesn't even really make sense. No, of course it does. Saying. No, it does too. That's true. That's true. I like that. Okay, I like so. that. Yeah. We'll give some people something to think about. Right. Something to, 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 to marinate on. You know, like, exactly. You can't come and kill yourself. Uh, so you can't come and kill yourself. I'm just saying. You do and then we leave you too. Uh, that's the thing. Uh, like, and so there you have two scenarios. Nothing is guaranteed. Yeah. What do I know? Maybe your aspiring rapper will finally blow up and you know, <laughs> you, you, you'll get to ball out with him there. Who knows? But there are certain things to consider. And yeah, I don't know. That's, that's, yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Okay. Like All right. So in my two past words, we're going to be talking about English words that, oh no, we're going to be talking about words that don't have an English translation, so to speak. And the first one is Frühjahrsmüdigkeit, and that's German. Frühjahr means spring, and Müdigkeit means tiredness. So it's basically mm. referring to the time when it's getting to spring or fall. The weather gets darker quickly, and some people suffer from, I guess you call it spring lethargy, mm -hmm. or just really d depression. It's called being over it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, where's the summer? And what's happening now? <laughs> The second one is ya, ya Bernie. It's Arabic. I'm sure I'm really? totally, totally mispronouncing that. But it is a declaration that you will die before another person because you can't bear not to live uh, to live without. Look at them. I know, right? Romantic. <laughs> <laughs> so it means you bury me or may you bury me. So. I see. And it's, it's, I guess it's typically a phrase uh, for parents towards their, mm -hmm. their children. So that's, well, that's quite interesting. that would make sense, mm -hmm. yes. A third one is Commovere, and that's Italian, and it's a heartwarming story that moves you to tears. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> the fourth one is another one in German called Kummerspeck, and it literally means grief bacon. So uh, mm. it refers to the weight that you gain when you're sad or depressed. You know how sometimes you're you in just it, eat and you your just, Yeah, exactly. You just want to eat, 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 eat. The next one is Mami la pinata pie, and it's Yagan. And it's the wordless, meaningful look shared by two people who want both want to initiate something, but none of them wants to um, none of them wants to start. So there's actually a term for it. And this term, this word is actually in the Guinness Book of Records for the most succinct word. So mm. that, that's something. That's something. The next one is a Thai word, and it's called Grand Jai. And it's the feeling of needing to ask someone for help, but feeling bad that you're going to ask them for help. Now, this is, a, this is more like, <laughs> that's a common emotion. Yes, and also the fearing, fearing that you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. The next one is Inuit, and it's ik, ik swapok, and it's the feeling of anticipation when you're waiting for somebody to show up. So you keep checking to see whether they've come. And I've, I've definitely got that. Like, you're waiting for yes. somebody, they're not coming, and you're like, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? <laughs> The next one is Norwegian and it's called palek and it's used to describe anything that you put on a sandwich. 
Mm. So there's a word to your word for that. The last one that I have for you is Koi no Yokan and it's Japanese. And it's the feeling of meeting someone and knowing it's an inevitable that you're going to fall in love with the person. How <laughs> oh, cute. Yes, or also the premonition of love. I think that's, that's so cute. Yes, and you know, <laughs> I mean, of course, words bear meaning. But also, I think the beautiful thing about this is words give you an insight into people's cultural Which, lives. Absolutely. That... These emotions are so important to them that they've created words for them. So you know who's romantic and dramatic, emotionally dramatic people. Like, okay. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and I there's a whole it. list of them. I yes. possibly couldn't do everything, but then there's a few. You can look them up. Really, really nice. I absolutely One of my favorite favorite german loan words is schnadenfreude oh yeah because i'm a petty i'm yeah. a petty i'm so petty right so uh schnadenfreude is something i'm just like mm -hmm. <laughs> sipping <laughs> as you destroy yourself like mm -hmm. yeah. and then there's sonder do you know sonder, sonder. sonder is um sonder? I sure. what is it i think it is i'm um, now that i've read, said it and now i don't remember it's the, the emotion you get from observing people and understanding that they have complete lives like you people watch and then you realize that wow this person has an entire mm. existence or whatever mm. it is anyway so yeah okay, yeah so that's 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 yes that's some words okay here. awesome right. that's so cool and she said it's not exciting yeah. right? <laughs> right so that's my two phases and that's it see, for today. see ya bye, bye.